So I just want to say briefly, in the lobby after this, there will be a book signing. So stick around. Henry, that was wonderful. Your talk brought together so many elements for me. And they were elements that kind of addressed so many of these political anxieties that we're seeing and feeling on a daily basis. And you put those anxieties into words, along with the realities that, that back them up. And when I say put into words, I mean sometimes creating a new language. So these phrases like disimagination zones and zombie politics, and you use educated hope, these phrases start to get at these hard to name phenomena that we're seeing and feeling in this neoliberal world. So why is it important to get the language right? What role does that play in moving us toward democracy? It's such an important, it's such an important question for me because I, I think that one of the ways in which domination begins to work is that it takes language and it turns it, it empties it out of any meaning by mm -hmm. making the claim that it's often just simply common sense. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. normalizes it. Right. And it normalizes it in multiple ways. I mean, it, it normalizes it by saying things like, the people are poor it's because they want to be. Mm -hmm. And everybody you know, goes like this. And Donald right. Trump says, yeah, that's right. You know. And the whole Republican party <laughs> says, yeah, that's right. Everybody's responsible for their own, their own fate. And I, and I think that we need a language that is it both inspires, energizes, but more importantly, ruptures the codes. Mm -hmm. You need a language that ruptures the codes. And I, and I think that there are multiple ways around which that is done. And for me, as I, you know, I mentioned earlier in the talk, and I didn't develop this, this, argue, this, this, this particular strain, strain of thought, I mean, around the question of language and power and politics, is that three things have to be acknowledged here. One, we live at a time in which the relationship between culture, politics, political power in everyday life is unlike anything we've ever seen before. So culture is the great educator. Mm -hmm. It's now the great educator. And since it's mostly corporate control, mm -hmm. it has a language that so constrains the possibility of imagining a different future that any language that's able to both interrogate and rupture that, but especially a language that can translate between private issues and public concerns mm -hmm. and bring things together in a way in which isolated events are more than that. They're mm -hmm. seen as something more than, they're seen as part of a larger systemic geography of power. I think that's why language to me is. And I'm also moved by language. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know about you, but I, I want language that dances. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I want language I can feel, you know? I want language that reminds me of Billie Holiday and Gramsci, <laughs> <laughs> you know? I want language that's like Fats Domino I, I don't want language that doesn't sing. I want language in which people can hear it and to be more specific, can make an investment in it by virtue of an identification with it. And I'm not keen on language for which that identification becomes, hides behind a firewall of jargon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think a lot of what you're getting at is imagination, the power to kind of collectively imagine, you know, and enjoy that imagining even. And when it comes to this kind of constraint of imagination that we're seeing, one of the things that, that you talked about and one of the kind of refrains in your work is that part of that restraint of our ability to imagine the future is our inability to remember the past. So our inability to kind of collectively understand that public memory. You talk about the loss of public memory. So what are the driving forces that have caused us to lose our public memory, and why is it important to reclaim it? I, I, I think that, I'll start by being pessimistic. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 think, that, I think that public memory is dangerous memory, mm. often. And, and I, I think there's an enormous attempt on the part of people who write history, which are usually the people who dominate history, mm. to erase public memory and to reconfigure it and to distort it. I mean, as you know, in Arizona, they're trying to eliminate ethnic studies from the history textbooks, right? I mean, Rick Santorum believes that dinosaurs and human beings is this existed on the Earth 6,000 years ago, and he would like to put that in history textbooks. 
Uh, and, I, and I think the message here at one level is pretty clear that historical, me historical memory, public memory, is often about arguments, about the outcome of struggles. It's, it's about evidence. It's about rigor. You know, it, it's, it's about looking at ourselves in ways in which we can ask fundamental questions about what is it about the past we don't want to repeat and what is it about the past that we want to appropriate. That's a huge intellectual, ethical, and political resource. And I think we live at a time in which those resources uh, are being destroyed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're being eliminated. They're, I mean, you know, every night I watch, I don't know why, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and I don't take drugs. <laughs> I just watch it because I want to get some sense of how this wonderful, brilliant young woman next to me who edits Truth Out can say things that are so profoundly important, and yet in this corporate screen culture I'm looking at, I'm witnessing a kind of stupidity that, that boggles the mind, <laughs> that literally boggles the mind. And, and you sit there and you realize the message here is simple. They understand that. Mm. They're, they're not stupid by, because they're ignorant. They're stupid because they want everybody else to be stupid. Mm -hmm. And it's safe. Mm. It's safe to be dumb, you know? Or it's safe to say outrageous things that now resonate with the culture of cruelty. Mm. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that, again, what this question, the, the imagination to me is a particularly important question because we don't use it much. You know, I, I use it with respect to two issues. I talk about the need for the for resurgence of the radical imagination, and I principally mean by that the importance of reclaiming democracy in a way that's robust and real, and asking ourselves, what isn't a democracy? I mean, how is what they call a democracy mm -hmm. not that at all? Secondly, how do we understand education in a more comprehensive sense? One that consistently is educating people through the schools and other places, through the larger through the cultural apparatuses and the screen cultures in ways that broaden their possibilities to think outside of the established scripts. Thirdly, how do we create political formations that take education seriously? I mean, I am convinced beyond doubt, one of my few elements of certainty, forgive me, in which I really think that pedagogy is central to politics. It's not marginal, it's central, because you have to be able to change the way people think in order to enlist them in a movement in which they can identify with the problems and the conditions in which we talk about. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the mainstream media doesn't do. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, I mean, thinking about this, this way in which education is central to politics, I think that when people hear education, it's schools, right. you know? It's sitting in a classroom, and once you're not doing that anymore, you're not participating in education. You're not, not just that you're not learning, but you're not digesting messages, and your thought processes aren't changing, which is obviously completely untrue. So I wonder if you can talk about, you alluded to this, talk about the role in, of the media in actually, in a positive sense, how can the media move us forward toward I mean, I, radical democracy? I, I mean, I, I think that one of the great things that I've seen in my lifetime, and I was born right after Lincoln died, uh, <laughs> one of those Cuban cars that look shiny on the outside but 130 inside. The, one of the things that I, I saw an enormous amount of censorship growing up, and I in being a working class kid and being on the left, we really never had access to, to the kind of media that would allow us to basically be able to define our narratives in ways that said that, you know, Napoleon crossed into Russia alone, right? That there were really working class struggles. There were alternative narratives. Something happens with the explosion of the new media mm -hmm. in the 1990s. All of a sudden, Noam Chomsky is online every day <laughs> writing an article, right? All of a sudden, people who never could never be published are publishing stuff that is, is basically educating an entire generation of youth in a new language, and also giving them the opportunity not just simply to expand their imaginations by being cultural critics, but also expanding the possibility for them to be cultural producers. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we see at places like Truth Out, and this is entirely, uh, I, I'm so in awe of this young woman, you know, entirely her doing, I mean, I mean to, to educate a whole generation of writers, to bring them in, and to say, hey, look, we don't want you to be smart. We want you to be public intellectuals. That's different. 
We want you basically to in integrate what you know with important social problems and believe that individually and collectively you can make a difference and you can do it by reading the word in order to read the world and reading the world in order to read the word. That's where my friend Paulo Freire was right. He got it right. He understood something about literacy in the broadest possible sense. It wasn't about skills. It was about learning how to intervene in the world with the resources you needed to be able to believe that you could change that world. And I think that's what the new media is doing. And I actually, I, I mean, I, my view is actually stronger on that, if that's possible. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I actually believe it's one of the few public spaces left where cities like Santa Fe will survive. You know, where people like you, and some of us who really believe we deserve a better world, where there, there is the possibility for airing our views, mm -hmm. for educating a different generation, creating new public spheres. I mean, I, I can't tell you how important for me. Every foundation in the United States that matters should be supporting these alternative public spheres. Every foundation. Because that's where the new public intellectuals, the new social movements, the, the relationships, the new journalists, the new intellectuals, that's where they're going to come from. They're not going to come from Disneyland. <laughs> they're, they're not going to come agree. from corporate-based schools. They're not going to come from, you know, from the billionaires club who want to turn everybody into idiots by having them fill in bubbles all day. You know? yeah. I mean, that's about the pedagogy of repression. I want to know where the spaces are for the pre pedagogies of hope. Right. right on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's so encouraging to hear you say that after a talk about the war on youth, you know, which is so real and so kind of building every day. And thinking about some of those obstacles that youth face, face I, I love the way you, you characterize the soft war and the hard war. And thinking about the software as commodification and commercialization and consumerism, and then the hard war, criminalization, punishment, death. And so I'm wondering, how do these two things interact? They, they, how do they fuel each other? What a wonderful question. Thank you. Yeah, that's fabulous. <laughs> and, I, and I'll give you the short answer. Yeah. They depoliticize people. Mm. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. The soft war depoliticizes people. It turns them into commodities, mm -hmm. or it turns, it turns them into brand names. It turns them into people, take 100 pictures of themselves a day, because that's how they're trying to, you know, that, that's how they're now trying to define their sense of identity. Uh, or or it, places, it, places, it, it places people in a position where the only hope that they have is to live in a world in which time is a deprivation. Mm. And so they're constantly struggling to survive. I mean, my father, Working class guy, his car would break down, he'd walk home. He had no choice. My car breaks down, I get on my cell phone. I call somebody and they come in and get it, right? Time was not a luxury for him. It was a deprivation. For too many young people, time is a deprivation. Mm -hmm. They live in a world in which they don't think about what it's going to be like to get ahead. They live in a world in which they think what it's going to be like to simply be able to survive. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the consumerist ethic, which offers no language, of hope, no language of politics, makes no relationships around power, history, class, race, gender, you name it. That's just a normative depoliticizing force. The hard war is more, obviously more cruel because the hard war doesn't just change your consciousness, it makes you disappear. You disappear from schools. There are no safe spaces. I mean, the great crime of authoritarian regimes, one of the great crimes in so-called democracies, is when they criminalize every aspect of social life. So that a kid who makes eye contact with a cop, that's a crime. They put him in the back of a van, they kill him. They break his back, driving, you know, make, driving the van erratically so he'll get hurt. Or walking while black. Or being like I was a, a working class kid in Providence, Rhode Island, the cops would come by and they would throw their billy clubs at your legs you know, in order to make sure you couldn't walk for, for three days. And especially if you were an athlete, that, then it was especially a, a good hit. You know, I mean, you, and, and, and it seems to me that, that, but in my world, when I was in school, if I, if I screwed up, somebody would come over and slap me in the back of the head and say, hey, shit, man, get with it, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do this. Now, we, you know, 
Educators have nothing to do with the questions of discipline. The police, are the, more police in the schools than teachers. The police come in, they handcuff. I mean, how many images do we have to see of 12 year olds with handcuffs, not around their wrists, but around their upper arms because their wrists are too thin? What, what does that mean? I mean, how do you talk about a society that does that to its children? If the ultimate index of morality is how a society treats its children, the hard war indicates we failed. Yeah, I mean, just some of those images, we respond so viscerally. Yeah. You know, they're so horrifying. And I think they all tie in with kind of this idea of disposability yeah. that you talk about, this, this idea also of individualizing larger social problems. So the poor are blamed for being poor. It's the individual's fault. The imprisoned are being blamed for being criminalized, even for things that you wonder why they're crimes. And so given like this, vis this visceral response, thinking about those handcuffs, I can understand why the financial elite and the political elite would endorse these types of policies and would say yes. But why are the rest of us saying yes? You know, why are so many people buying in? I mean, look, there, there, there are three or four things here that are so crucial to that, answering that question. One is, it starts in the late 1970s, right? In the 1980s, when, when all of a sudden, the war on poverty becomes the war on the poor. Mm -hmm. And we see it in the drug wars and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. But what we see is a relentless attack on any notion of the democratic social. We see an, a, a relentless attack on compassion. Mm -hmm. We see a relentless attack on solidarity, on social relationships that matter, to the point where a language begins to develop that serves two purposes. One, it becomes common sense that people who inhabit these spaces of abandonment and impoverishment and, and persecution have to blame themselves. Mm -hmm. We have no language for now linking these individual problems, troubles to larger structural issues. But I, but I think that the, the second issue is that the language of democracy and compassion and justice has receded mm -hmm. to such a degree that you actually gain political points by producing a culture of cruelty that appeals to the most basis of what I would call uh, the hardening of the culture. And I'll, I'll give you just, you know, these examples are everywhere, right? But Ar Arizona, the governor of Arizona, is that still in the country? <laughs> <laughs> she, she took out $2 million from the organ donor program. People died. She al reallocated $2.4 million to a program to build bridges over the highways to eliminate squirrel kill. That's one example. Uh, an example that comes out of Star Wars, right? The second example is that some states, they privatize social services to the point where if your house is burning down and you don't have a, a contract with a private service, the, the fire people will actually come, and this happened in Tennessee. They actually came, the house was burning down. He said, I'll buy the contract, it's $60, I'll buy it. They laughed. The house burned down and the dogs died. And you think, that's worse than Newt Gingrich. I mean, Newt Gingrich, who says things like, children who get free lunches should work as janitors. We should fire all the janitors and make them do the work, as if they could even do the work, right? As if it isn't complicated work. You know? But I mean, this is the kind of cruelty that has now seeped into an extremism in the United States, in which it gains points. I mean, when you listen to Trump, the, the issue is not, is he a fool, is he stupid, is he ignorant? The issue is, look how symptomatic he is of how down the road we've gone with respect to democracy and justice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thinking about Trump, you've written about him. <laughs> grudgingly, because <laughs> um, I'm thinking about this, this broad and exciting notion of democracy that you've been illustrating, and 
last night was the Democratic debate. Your talk was more interesting. And, <laughs> and I'm wondering, what's the relationship between this vision of democracy, this vision in which there really is a notion of the common good and electoral politics, or is there no relationship? There's certainly no relationship under capitalism. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, it seems to me that you have to be brain dead to think that elections are the measure of democracy, which elections for the presidency cost a billion dollars to enter. Right. I, mean, I mean, look, I mean, let's take those, those really rabid, radical Democrats, the Koch brothers. <laughs> they make $3 million an hour on their dividends, more than I make as a college professor. <laughs> I'm jealous of that. I mean, when you get political candidates that have to travel to the Koch brothers, I mean, I mean, this guy from Wisconsin, I mean, what's his name? Scott Walker. My God. I mean, he takes $200 million out of the university system, and he gives it to the Milwaukee Bucks to build a basketball stadium. I mean, these are the kind of priorities that we're talking about, where only capital matters, capital accumulation. I mean, look, this is not an argument against markets. Don't misinterpret me. I love markets. I love buying Armani jackets. You bet. I was a working class kid, you know? Marx said the working class deserves the best. What I don't want is a market society. What I don't want is a society in which the economic, neoliberal economics governs all of social life, where the ultimate measure of everything we do is the accumulation of capital. And so my point, sorry, to get back to your question, is that you cannot have a democracy when money rules politics. It doesn't work. That's not a democracy. And this is why we have to be weary of any candidate who yeah. is operating within established political frameworks in which, on one level, you have very conservative, ultra-right-wing extremist funders, and on another level, you have liberal money machines. They're still money machines. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders, he says all the right things, for, except for a few things. But, <laughs> uh, and and we, need to hear, we need to hear that language. But please forgive me for saying this. We need a third political party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we a need, fourth. And a fourth. We need political parties. We need democratic socialism. We need to understand that capitalism and democracy are not the same thing. They're not synonymous. Yeah, I definitely think that when you look at the conversations that are being had, like on the campaign trail, among the candidates, in their carefully released pub public statements, you see this continual return to common sense. Oh. This idea that, you know, you're progressive within reason. You're progressive within the constraints of getting things done. And, but you talk about this need to demand the impossible and this need to hope in the face of anything. Huh. And so, yeah, so I'm wondering, I, I would begin with the assumption that common sense is a form, the appeal to common sense is a form of civic illiteracy. Mm -hmm. That would be my starting point. Mm -hmm. And my, 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 my next point would be, in a democracy, you have to take the question of agency seriously. You have to take seriously what the conditions are that enable the capacities for people to be able to question the whole power accountable, to be critical, to have visions, to be imaginative, and to engage in the kind of dialogue in public spheres that promote that, that allow them to have some control over the conditions that bear down on their lives. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Will you run for president yeah. is my next question. <laughs> so again and again, you come back to this idea of the common good, yeah. whether it's being lost or whether it's the thing we need to pursue. I guess my question is, what is the common good? Is it we can all survive? Is it about survival? Is it we, the idea that we can get what we want, do what we want? What's, what's I, I the think, common I think I think when we talk about the commons, what we have to ask ourselves are what are the things that we have in common and need to be considered in common in order to survive with dignity? Mm 
and not have to worry about corporations turning off our electricity or, or, our, or privatizing our water right. or not saying that, I mean, I want to say every kid in the United States should have a free education. That's, in the, that's for the common good. Yeah. That's the common good, right? Yeah. I want to say, look, we need to invest in infrastructures. We need to build up cities. We need to build libraries. You know, we need to make sure that as people age, they don't have to worry about whether their retirement is going to be eliminated because some corporation claims bankruptcy and they can't imagine a future without despair. I don't want a country in which despair governs people's lives. And that means that we have to identify the resources that should be enabled and held in common and protected and not privatized so that that can happen. So, I love that. I love that. <laughs> and I think that in, as we're facing this like extreme kind of like frightening specter, really, and then you, you come at that with this kind of vision of really endless hope, hoping in the face of anything. What are your, your words of wisdom, I guess, in terms of just keeping that hope within ourselves? I, I, How I do we hold on? I, I, think, I think to not hope is to become complicitous. Mm -hmm. That's the first warning sign. And I think the second warning sign is to recognize that even in, the, in, in historically, historically in periods of even the worst depression, people resisted. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were always people capable of imagining a different life. And I, and I think there's something about, and we're not talking about disney hope, you know? We're not talking about a romanticized Pollyannish hope. We're talking about a hope that is very rigorous in recognizing the realities you have to face and what has to be done. You know, it's an impatient hope. It's an impatient patience. You know, it's a hope that is solidified in the, ta in the, in the recognition that this may not happen tomorrow. You know, it's not gonna come with a big bang. But it's going to come, and it will come. And people can be educated, and people, it seems to me, can be moved, and people can be compassionate, and people can be willing to struggle. We just have to take it seriously and act on it. Yes. That's it. Yeah. So we're going to leave it there. Our timer, our timer is up. We'll leave you with hope. Thank you so much for coming Thank out. Thank you so this much. This has really been fabulous. Really.